Good morning, hey, Sills folks and guests. Thanks for joining our study. We're in 1 Kings chapter 17. Uh, just real quickly, the kings in the north that we've talked about, Israel in the north, you got Jeroboam, the founding king. His son Nadab, because of Jeroboam's sins, he was cut off uh, just within two years, as the prophet said. Then Basha, uh, was the one who assassinated Nadab, and he reigned a fairly long time. And then his son Ella uh, reigned, but Basha was told by a prophet he also be cut off. So his son reigned less than two years, and he was assassinated in a drunken stupor in the uh, town of Israel, uh, Terza, the capital city. And then he was assassinated by Zimri, who was a seven-day king, one week, but he wiped out the whole family of Basha. And then Omri... Uh, comes, he's the general of the armies of Israel. He's out besieging a Philistine town when he hears about Zimri's uh, assassination of Ella. So he comes with his people, his uh, Israelites to support him. And they besieged the capital city and, and uh, took it. And Zimri committed suicide. And then there was a four-year uh, civil war, but Omri's forces overcame. He was a powerful king but not well spoken of in the book of First Kings because spiritually he was very corrupt. He went the way of Jeroboam to an extreme, in fact, going more direct in his worship uh, and uh, the worship he gave to Baal and Asherah and so forth. And his son Ahab is the, the bottom spiritually of all the kings but so far, but he is uh, at a time of wealth. So Omri is kind of a type of David who defeated the foes, expanded the, the kingdom, and yet was not like David in the fact he was idolatrous. And David is a man for God's own heart. And now you have a sort of like an anti-Solomon, uh, enjoying the wealth and the, the military victories of his father. And so we have the northern kingdom now at the really the bottom of its uh, paganism, uh, Baal worship is direct now. Ahab marries Jezebel, the princess of a priest of Baal who became king by assassination. And so now we're introduced to Elijah and Elisha. They'll go all the way, all the way into the next book, 2 Kings. Elijah is the great prophet. He's equal to Moses in the minds of the Jews. Um, you see during his ministry and during Elisha's ministry, a great flow of miracles that's not seen except during the Exodus and during the ministry of Christ. Not seen very often. You see a great flow of miracles because the emergency is great. The paganism is great. And this is the northern kingdom. They won't survive past 722 B.C., but their idolatry impacted the southern kingdom, Judah, which would be exiled but would survive and through them the Messiah would come uh, so we, we see when Jesus was on, in his ministry on Mount of Transfiguration there was Elijah and there was Moses speaking to Jesus about the cross uh, incredibly great man spiritually um, let's read verse 1 of 1st Kings 17 now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Tishbite is an unknown city. Uh, scholars have uh, have not had any success trying to find what that city, that, the location of that city, a mound now would be. Gilead is east of the Jordan. Uh, it bordered Arabia. Uh, so it's mountainous and dry and wild. Elijah comes from there. He's, he's, a, he's a desert man, kind of like John the Baptist. John the Baptist fashioned himself after Elijah in many ways. Uh, Elijah's the guy who wears the leather belt, belt and wears the camel hair outfit. And his message is threefold. Number one, uh, the Lord as he lived is a living God. And here he's speaking to Ahab with his queen uh, Jezebel, who worshiped the god Baal, the one who supposedly brings rain and fertility to the land. And he says, as the Lord lives, uh, I, uh, whom I, in whose presence I stand, he's in contact with God, bringing a direct word from Yahweh. 
Uh, there won't be rain unless I say so. What an amazing thing to say. And James chapter 5 tells us that Elijah actually prayed fervently that there would not be rain. And then he uh, prayed that it would return, the rain would return later in his ministry. So he's praying against his own people? Is that unusual? It's not a impre uh, imprecatory prayer like sometimes you see in the Psalms where the psalmist prays, God, you know, please, you know, wipe these people out. Uh, they're unjust. It's not, it's, it's not something about the enemies of God. These are God's people. This, this is a prayer to correct his own people, Israel, and to uh, reclaim them, restore them. Uh, we see that with Paul telling the Corinthians to put the sinful, immoral man out of the church so that he'd be in Satan's domain in a sense and would repent, possibly have an opportunity to repent and return, which he did. So, you know, the ten plagues of Moses uh, that God brought, those were all affronts or assaults on the Egyptian gods. And so here is Elijah representing Yahweh, the invisible, immortal, uh, ever-present, omnipotent God, right in the very heart, the court of the king Ahab who worshiped Baal, talking to Ahab about there not being rain when Baal, Ahab's God, is the king, is the god of, of rain. So this is a challenge directly to the god of Baal who is dead. That's, that's really Elijah's whole ministry is proclaiming Baal is dead. He does not exist and he has no control, but Yahweh does. Um, God had warned in Deuteronomy 11 other places before they came to the promised land that if they sin, take care lest your heart be deceived, you turn aside, serve other gods, and worship them, then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and he will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain, and the land will yield no fruit, and you will perish quickly off the good land that the Lord has given you. So here's this guy who's dressed like John the Baptist, the original John the Baptist, He's a wild man, comes from an area where the town can't even be found because Gilead's such a wild territory. And he appears almost as out of nowhere. And they're even too stunned after he makes this proclamation to even seize him. He just leaves. And then verse 2, And the word of the Lord came to him, Depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, and he went and lived by the brook Cherith, that is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. And after a while the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. So he was told to hide himself, not out of fear necessarily, but make himself unavailable. Uh, cross the Jordan River, get out of here, Go to the wildlands. God's taking away any voice of a prophet. That's part of his judgment, taking away the voice of the prophet. Hearing God's word is not just something we can count on. It's not a right. It's a privilege, and God can make it scarce. In Deuteronomy 32, he says, May my teachings drop as rain and my speech distill, distill as the dew, like gentle rain upon the tender grass. Amos said uh, on God's behalf, I'll call a famine, not a famine of rain, but rather of the words of God. Part of God's judgment is removing the witness of God's word at times as a judgment against people. Hosea said the same thing, my people perish for a lack of vision. That means word of God, uh, revelation. Cherith, where he was going to go, uh, this brook Cherith, um, it's a seasonal brook, probably came down from a mountain and had torrents at times. It meant cutting. Uh, and so it's interesting that, that uh, Elijah, this man who had this great public ministry, is going to go in private and live in an isolated, dry land again. And he's, it's, a, it's a place of cutting or separating. Maybe testing would be another way of putting it. The ravens feed him. That's kind of humiliating, but amazing and miraculous. They're scavengers. They eat carrion. Uh, and so he had to wait for them to bring his food to him. That's kind of, these are unclean animals, and this is sort of humiliating. And he's got to get on his belly and lap this water. It's not a, probably just a, a limited amount of water. 
And so he undergoes this separation, this testing, just like Joseph did in prison 13 years, or Paul uh, was in Arabia for seven years. I think it was Moses 40 years in the wilderness. Um, so we know from James that, that uh, Elijah prayed for the correction of, of God's people. God, uh, keep your covenant promises or your covenant judgments because your people are wicked. And why, why would he uh, pray that? I think God gave him that prayer. I think the, the prayers that God wants us to pray, he gives us, he nudges us, so that when we pray them, we receive from him, he is delighted to give us. Uh, and so here's the king and queen. They were sitting in this throne room, totally devoted to Baal. And, um, and so God is preparing Elijah to go away for a while, be solitude, and hide out as a judgment against the nation. And then the brook dried up because the whole land uh, was receiving no rain, as Elijah said. So he's a, he's a victim of his own success, right, of his own successful word. Then verse 8, Then the word of the Lord came to him, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. Just like he commanded the ravens, here he says, I command a widow. You know, if God has you on mission and you're walking in obedience, he's going to take care of you. He's going to sustain you. And it's the word of the Lord comes to him. It's all by the word of the Lord. Uh, and it's 75 mile walk. He's to leave this dry desert place east of the Jordan and go west to the Mediterranean Sea, to the coast, to Phoenicia, to Sidon, which was at peace with Israel at this time. Um, but this is the very heart of Baal worship. Here is the prophet who's confronting Baal, going to the very heart of Baal. And he goes to Zarephath, which means smelting place. There was a refiner there to burn off slag from materials. Uh, this is part of Sidon. In fact, it's funny that here is Elijah hiding. Jezebel's trying to find him, and he is hiding in her very area, close to her hometown in Sidon, in the, in the very capital of Baal worship. Um, and so verse 10, he arose and he went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called her and he said, bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And she was going to bring it. He called to her and said, bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, as the Lord your God, you notice your God, lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I am gathering a couple sticks that I may go in, prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as, as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterward, make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, The jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said, and she and her household ate for many days. The jar of the flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. So basically, this woman is dying. Uh, the whole region is afflicted by this famine. The people in the coastal areas, of course, they had fish, uh, but if you were totally poor and uh, the, their meal crops came from Palestine, that was their their wheat, barley, and so forth. And so they were starving, especially if you're poor. So she's dying. She's going to cook this final little meal, not even enough for one little tortilla, tortilla of bread. And it's you know, how humbling that Elijah, to him, was fed by these ravens and drank in this nearly dry brook. And then here he's got to be sustained by whom? By a widow who's about to die. She's dying. And she's about to die of starvation. She's so poor. And this is who's going to sustain Elijah? How, how God is testing Elijah, right? God uses the foolish and weak things. To, to confound the wise and to humble us. And Elijah, he has to go against everything. He's going to a pagan territory. He's going to, to the very heart of Baal worship. This woman is a pagan. She's not a Jew. She's a foreigner. There's all kinds of 
of uh, things that the Jews had against foreigners, uh, the, the more righteous ones, and concerns about their idolatry, of course. What an awkward thing to say. I, I know you're dying. I know you're poor. Just make me a cake first, then make yourself a cake. It'll be okay. And she, he gives her the promises of God to sustain her miraculously. Uh, and she says, uh, as the Lord your God lives. So these people knew he was a Jew. He was a wild man. He was a man of God. Something gave that away. But they were syncretists. That they were okay with Yahweh. But their main God was Baal. They, they mixed and matched the gods. This woman has tremendous generosity, if you think about it, or faith. More than the woman that had the two mites that Jesus observed giving. Because that woman, uh, she, she at least had others, presumably, she could talk to who weren't poor like her. She could possibly beg for more. Uh, this woman was in a region, an area that was starving. Everyone was starving and suffering. And so uh, her faith was even more tested. And, and, and Jesus said that that woman that uh, she gave more than any others that day. Um, she's practically dying, and she's preparing the last meal for her son, and yet she's willing to believe this prophet's word and give him food first. And so, well, God does give promises. Part of being a Christian is responding to the God who's rich in mercy, right? Who, who The God who gives us eternal life, provision. Uh, otherwise, uh, how could we trust him unless he promised and showed, demonstrated he's a God of unlimited provision and eternal life? And so having heard the word of the God, of God, she obeyed the gospel that she heard. She, she obeyed the word of God that she heard. That was the word of her salvation physically. She was saved. She obeyed the word of, a God, of God despite the false beliefs. She received uh, the word of the Lord. Uh, Jesus uh, mentioned that um, there were many widows in Israel during this famine, as he looked back a thousand years back. But Elijah didn't go to them. He went to this pagan woman. He, he said that while he was speak, speaking to his hometown in the synagogue, and they tried to kill him for this. He was saying hey, your faith is in nationalism or is in uh, your patriotism, your belief that Jews are superior. But uh, did, don't you know that Elijah went to a foreigner? Don't you think this gospel, this good news, this kingdom is bigger, that this, this righteousness from God is not just about the Jews? So she obeys. She's not transactional. She doesn't say, okay, are you sure? You know, demonstrate something for me, you know. We're saved by grace through faith, not by any of our works. She didn't offer to do something in return for belief. Uh, and she just believed and she acted in her belief. Faith without works is apparently dead, James says. And so her works, her actions showed her childlike faith. And God is rich in mercy to this foreign woman, right? To pay attention to her and to touch her life, to have mercy upon her. Um, this is where we kind of get the gospel upside down, though. We think the gospel is about us. You know, it's all about us. It reminds me of that song by uh, Carly Simon back in the early 70s. You're so vain. And one of the lines is, you probably think the song is about you. And I always want to say, well, the song actually is. But we think the Bible is all about us. Well, it, it really isn't about us, primarily. We are the beneficiaries. But it's about something else. This woman... God had purposes for her and her son bigger than her and her son. It was went far beyond them. But she was a beneficiary of his purposes. So the same with us. We get the gospel upside down. We think God's there. It's his job to save us. It's all about us. We're so lovable. And we get the gospel upside down. We don't understand that we're saved for his glory, for his purposes. We benefit, but it, the purposes go way beyond us to God's glory and other mysteries. And then finally, verse 17, after this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. And his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, what have you against me, O man of God? In the Hebrew, it's a very simple idiom that we 
don't really fully understand how to translate it. It just simply says, what, man of God? So either, what do you have against me? Or some translations say, what do you and I have in common? We don't know that idiom. It's long lost. Uh, so this is a, a decent uh, effort. What, do you, what, man of God? What do you have against me? It's a good way of maybe getting that meaning. She goes on to say, You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. And he said to her, Give me your son. And he took him from her arms and carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged and laid him on his bed. So he was lodging with this widow. He was sleeping in the upper chamber. Uh, I'm sure it was a very poor little house. She's poor. Uh, I mean, she wasn't poor always. She had a house. But the famine had made her recently very destitute. No food. And nobody else had much food or money. Otherwise, she could sell her house. And when he got up to the chamber, he cried to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourn by killing her son? Do you hear the desperation? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, let this child's life come back into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. And the life of the child came into him again, and he re revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house, and he delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. She's, she's truly a believer at this point in Yahweh. Uh, it's such a shocking thing to happen. After God was merciful and had shown mercy and goodness to suddenly have her son die. Uh, the grief of a mother losing a child. You know, we've had some uh, parents losing children and um, it's just, it's unspeakable. But more than that, even for this one, was a loss of status and support. Her son would be her retirement, her means of not being destitute when he got older. Um, and so in her mind jumps immediately to her sin. She's wondering why, uh, son of God, this, he says, the man of God, have you know, have you come? And then you living in my house, has that brought attention to my sin? Just having you, a holy man, has that brought God? In other words, I was a kind of a pretty careless sinner, and I wasn't really thinking about God's judgment, but it seemed like you've drawn God's attention to me. That was kind of a pagan idea, that you could bring God's attention <laughs> uh, to a situation. That was just sort of her limited understanding. You know, but maybe it would be better if you hadn't, if you hadn't. But she forgets that she would have died if Elijah had not come along. But she does think her own sin, and maybe it's causing the death of her son. Think about that grief. That's a deep, deep hard grief to think that perhaps your own sin has caused the death of your son and that this man's presence has hastened that judgment. Um, in one sense, she's theologically correct. Uh, the Against you and you alone, David said, have I sinned, O God. Um, and yet that wasn't what it was about. It wasn't about her sin. Uh, this is like Lazarus' death when Jesus said his illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so the Son of Man, the Son of God, may be glorified through it. Um, and it was shocking what happened here. It was shocking to Elijah. It's, he's kind of like Moses when Moses co you know, confronted God and was desperate and prayed that God would not wipe out his people for fear of the reputation of the Lord, Yahweh, the one true God, being um, lost among the nations he wasn't offended Elijah's not offended by this woman's anger and the despair his prayer is a cry right you don't see the confident calm Elijah you saw in the court of Ahab or on Mount Carmel with the when he lays down the challenge to the prophets of Baal and Asherah what's the difference well in those cases he knew what God wanted that makes all the difference in the world. We, we learn on Mount Carmel. We learn later in the story. God had told him to make this challenge. He didn't come up with this on his own. But in this case, he was totally in the dark. 
And so therefore he's desperate. He's human and he's honest and he's bold. He, he, large prayer. God let his life return to him. Never in the Old Testament was a life raised like this and restored, resuscitated like this. And he lays on the boy three times. That's how desperate he is. And yet the Bible says in verse 22, the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. It wasn't the posture. His posture of laying on this boy, that was a posture reflecting his desperate need and his faith. You know, postures don't move God on their own. You know, raising your hands or kneeling or lying prostrate uh, before God. Those are simply postures that help us express faith help that faith be expressed to ourselves and to God. And so uh, it was his prayer, though, that God heard. And her reaction is a profession of faith. Now I know you're a man of God, and the word of God, the truth is in your mouth. It makes me think of Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined, he inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry blog, bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Job said, I heard you by the hearing of the ear, but now I see you. He, he saw the works of God. You know, we do need this. Faith is by hearing the word of God. That's where faith starts. You have to have truth. But that's not all of faith. Faith also grows through experience. Faith is built on experience, right? It's not just an academic thing that we're here in this life of Christ. We need answers to prayers. And he is delighted to give us answers to prayer as we pray according to his will and uh, with faith. Faith in him, not our own merit, our own works but faith in him not of our this is not of yourselves so um, some people who are believers really need an answer to prayer and I mean not praying for someone who's sick they get well I mean something more than that more kingdom related why don't we see as many prayers answered here in the United States as we hear about missionaries and other Christians believers in other parts of the world well because they're more desperate they have a greater need, and so they have a larger prayer, a larger ask. And if they ask according to God's will, they're going to see more answers. That's just what the Bible teaches. Um, we need those answers. That's part of our growing in faith. Ask God large things and wait upon him. And make sure your asking is according to his will, which will come from reading his word and knowing his will. James says, you have not because you ask amiss. You ask according to your selfish desires that you may spend on what you get. So ask kingdom word. Look at the scriptures, read the scriptures, and pray in a way that would be pleasing to God. Pray according to his will. He is pleased to give supernatural answers. Not the supernatural, perhaps, that we see in the Bible because these were attesting God's word when it was fresh. It was newly written, a new people, but it sure will could be. God can perform something that's of a biblical proportion, and he can perform miracles that people would scratch their heads and couldn't understand how that could happen as well. Um, so this Elijah seems to be kind of in a testing mode, right? God's preparing his faith, humbling him, to rely on ravens and a poor widow, a starving, dying widow, to live in, in hiding and in private. You, you know God was speaking to him and, and he teaching him to pray, teaching him mercy upon this widow, teaching him for mercy uh, about mercy and love. Why all this preparation? Because Elijah's going to have a very public ministry. He's going to come out and challenge the prophets of Baal. He's going to prove Baal's deadness. His work is great. He's confronting a bell infected nation of Israel that is a dead corpse like this boy. And he's having to confront and try to revive or at least righteously represent God's way of revival through repentance. 
And so it's a it's really kind of a gospel picture here, I think. Uh, this woman reminds me of, of believers. Uh, she's cut off and separate and foreign to God. She's not part of his covenant like we are. We are strangers, not, not close to him, but far from him, enemies of his. And she heard the word of God. It was brought to her. She had to get a call. We have to get a call from God. We don't make the call for ourselves. Heaven doesn't receive collect calls. God has the call. She's called by God through Elijah to do something of faith, to believe. And she responds with childlike faith. It's not by works, but by grace we are saved. And uh, she's... She sees God's mercies. It saves her life, and it saves her son's life. She learns even more of God's mercy when she's even more desperate. And then Romans 4 kind of reminds me, I read this in the King James Version. It's about Abraham, but it reminds me a little bit of this woman. And being not weak in faith, he, Abraham, considered not his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old, neither yet deadness of Sarah's womb. He didn't consider that something too great to overcome. He understood God was greater. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. This woman staggered not at an audacious request. And being fully persuaded that he had had, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able to perform. That's what she was persuaded that God would perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone, it was imputed that it was imputed to him, but also for, for us, to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our, our justification. Just like this woman's son was dead and raised. God's son was dead and raised for our justification and he was put to death for our sin. And this woman, uh, in, she got imputed righteousness. She was a righteous, I believe, woman of God because she heard the calling of God and responded with faith. Is that something you've done? Have you responded with faith? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. As we think of this incredible man, Elijah, James says he's just an ordinary man, and yet he stepped out with an extraordinary prayer. You spoke to him first, so we acknowledge that. We're not to make this stuff up, but to see in your word and to believe about your character, about your mission for us, and to act accordingly, ask accordingly. We can also pray prayers of righteousness, of righteousness that are effectual, that are fervent, that have effect. Father, we can have more and more of these answers to prayers uh, as we pray closer to your will. Help us, God, to humble ourselves. Oh, how you humble those you do great things through. How you humble them and teach them to trust you. And you do this to Elijah. And so we receive your testing. We receive affliction. We receive correction as part of your love for us, your desire to use us for your greater purposes. And God, we also ask you to increase our faith that we'd ask greater things according to your will. That we'd be according to your will, that we would uh, read your word and reflect upon it and love you and worship you through and by your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit present with us in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Thank you so much, Hayes Hills people. God bless you. Next week, 1 Kings 18.